So what I am going to talk about is our U.S. CEOs overpaid and uh, the U.S. corporate governance system has been demonized. There are some of the demons, uh, Eber, Skilling, Grasso, Scressi, Kozlowski, and friends, uh, and Eisner. Um, and, uh, you know, this has probably happened since 2002 uh, that uh, corporate governance has come under uh, attack, scrutiny if not attack. And, We've had scandals, we've had socks, CEO pays in the news all the time, we had backdating, uh, and U.S. boards are <coughs> criticized uh, pretty much um, you know, every day virtually uh, for paying executives too much, not paying for performance, and being too friendly to management, and U.S. CEOs are criticized as using their positions to set their pay and earn too much, and stealing when they can. And uh, you know, I picked out some Senate testimony from Nell Minow, who's a, a shareholder activist. CEOs are the only ones who pick the people who set their pay, and they, they pay the people who set their pay. The pay performance disparity is so outrageous, so atrocious, that in my opinion, it undermines the credibility uh, of our system of capitalism. Uh, and Bebchuk, and that's not an academic perspective. Um, from an academic perspective, you have uh, Lucian Bebchuk, who's uh, more or less argued that flawed compensation arrangements are uh, widespread, persistent, and systemic. And even the president, president uh, a few months ago, said government should not decide the compensation for America's executives, but the salaries and bonuses of CEOs should be based on their success. America's corporate boardrooms must step up to their responsibilities. You need to pay attention to the executive compensation packages you approve. So are the critics right? <coughs> the answer is no. Uh, is it true that CEOs are overpaid? Uh, I will argue no. Uh, is it true that CEOs are not paid for performance? Uh, the typical CEO is paid for performance. And as far as boards go, is it true that public company boards are doing such a bad job? The answer is no. They actually seem to be doing a better job. So. Let me uh, talk about uh, why I say this, and this is based on uh, probably two or three papers that I've written, uh, and uh, as well as uh, uh, some of work other people have done. So as we go through this, remember there are two ways to look at pay. One is kind of an estimated uh, basis, which is salary, bonus, restricted stock, and the expected value of options that a board gives to the CEO, and this is usually calculated using something like Black-Scholes, and it's estimated because it's not what they actually walk away with, it's the value that people think is the value in the year the compensation is given. Then there's actual or realized. Uh, this is a better measure of what the CEOs actually take off the table, and this is salary, bonus, restricted stock, and the value of options exercised. So the big difference here is the Black-Scholes calculation in the year the options are granted, that's on the estimated side. That's what boards think they're giving. And then the ex post, which is the realized, which swaps black shoals or swaps options exercise for black shoals. So what do we see when we look at CEO pay? You know, you wouldn't know this from what you read in the press, but CEO pay has declined since 2000 on an average basis. This is S&P 500 CEO pay. And on a median basis, it's also declined a little bit from 2001, but has basically been flat. And this is in uh, real terms through 05. But you would never know that average CEO pay has declined over this period. Still pretty high, though. Average is 10 million, <laughs> uh, and uh, median is, is almost 8 million. And this is, this is the average, or this is the estimated. This is Black-Scholes. What does it look unrealized? Realize it kind of looks, you know, not all that different, but the realized, you see, the average peaked in 2000, uh, went down, went up, and kind of followed, you know, you might notice it follows the stock market, which will tell you they're paid for performance, which we'll see later. Um, and the median has gone up. Uh, the median is more like 6 million. The average is 12 million, so there's a big skew in pay. So. You know, while the criticism cont continues unabated, CEO pay has actually declined. That's point one. Um, point two, uh, which group is which here? 
Uh, one group is the 10 highest paid CEOs uh, in realized pay. Uh, one group is the top 10 in ex ante pay. And one group is another group. So uh, which one is the top 10 in ex ante pay, the pay that boards actually thought they were given? How many of you think it's A? How many do you think it's B? And how many do you think it's C? Okay. You're not all voting, so you get an F for participation. <laughs> but uh, the answer is C is ex ante pay. It's the lowest. This is what boards think they're getting or they're giving. B is realized pay. And you expect realized to be more skewed because it has uh, what actually happens. And A is hedge fund managers. So. Uh, there they are. And the other thing that's kind of amusing is the top 25 hedge fund managers in 2004 earned $6.3 billion cumulative. That is greater than the pay of all 500 S&P 500 CEOs measured either way. So who's overpaid? Uh, <laughs> so the point is CEOs are not the only ones who earn a lot. And if you look at what fraction of the top AGI brackets CEOs comprise, and you compare 94 and 04, uh, and this is on estimated pay. So this is the pay the boards think they're giving. It is identical, meaning CEO pay has gone up, but they've gone up kind of just like a lot of other very fortunate people, including uh, the hedge fund people. And where they are in the income distribution on estimated pay is about the same. So who else is earning more money? Well, let's look at, call the CEOs Main Street. Uh, let's look at Wall Street. And um, this is investment bankers. So. Uh, we uh, estimate uh, how many investment bankers are in the top brackets. And it uh, turns out that there are a lot of investment bankers in the top brackets, actually more than executives of public companies. <coughs> um, hedge fund fees over time uh, have grown from like under $5 billion in 1994 uh, to over you know, roughly $30 billion in 05. And this is not, you know, this is not per person, so it's it's not exactly apples to apples. It's hard to measure per person, but uh, you can just see that the amount of money going to hedge fund managers has obviously increased a huge amount, and some of those people are obviously showing up at the very top. Uh, venture capital and private equity, a uh, very similar picture. Uh, fees in, uh, you can look in '94, probably total about $5 billion. You go to uh, 2004, 2005, uh, $30 billion. This is why Austin wants to tax them. Um, average profits uh, per partner at law firms. So it's not just the, the business school graduates. Uh, it's also the law school graduates. This is the <laughs> average profits uh, per partner at the top 50 law firms. Uh, and you can see a quarter of a million, half a million, one and a quarter million. Uh, and the numbers have gone up. So it's not only the averages, but there are more of them. And uh, this is uh, the fraction, how much they comprise of the top income brackets. And again, from 94 to 04, which is the period when the CEO pay exploded, lawyers did even better, or at least in terms of the number of increase of lawyers in the top 0.1%. And then to be fair, the lawyers are probably not in the top 0.01 or 001%. Uh, but they're, they've done pretty well. So put it all together, uh, the groups that, and this is a paper I wrote with Josh Rao, uh, we found uh, basically somewhere like 17 to 25 percent of the people in the very top income groups. And uh, we found that there are actually more people from Wall Street, uh, about twice as many as Main Street, Main Street being the CEOs. And uh, there's a picture. The red is Main Street, uh, and the uh, blue is Wall Street, and then you got the law partners. So a lot of people making a lot of money. What does this mean? Um, you know, CEOs are basically, they've been very fortunate, have done very well, but it's not clear they're all that different. Um, and uh, you know, that's the point. 
that this pay increases are systemic at the top end. It's not limited to CEOs who allegedly set their own pay. And you know, it's hard to see how those results of these other groups are explained by stealing. And when you see these very similar groups um, make a lot of money, uh, you're sort of pushed to an explanation that it's probably, you know, maybe on the margin some people are stealing, but the basic pattern uh, has got to be something else. What is that? Well, technological change and greater scale uh, increase the returns or productivity at the top end. And you put talented people in bigger companies and you apply technology, uh, they make more money. So back to CEOs and boards. Uh, are CEOs paid for performance? So I've just said, you know, that's what CEOs are paid a lot. So are other people. Uh, it's not clear they're out of line. Uh, now, are CEOs paid for performance? Are they penalized for performance? And is there a market? And uh, you know, there was Barney Frank, who was uh, quoted as saying, "Academic studies show very little correlation between higher compensation and better performance." Uh, he obviously didn't read. Our paper. Um, so here's what uh, Josh and I did. Uh, we took uh, the ExecuComp data, which is a standard data set. We sorted firms uh, each, and this works each year, uh, into groups on size, because size uh, is, you know, pay does move with size. Then we looked at realized compensation. Uh, where we sorted CEOs uh, by realized compensation. So this is the compensation they actually walked off with. And then we looked at the performance of the firms where the CEOs walked off with a lot and where they walked off with a little. And what do you find? Well, in every size quintile, there is a monotonic relationship, meaning the firms where the pay is the lowest the stock returns are the lowest. The pay where the, uh, the quintiles where uh, the pay is the highest, performance is the highest, uh, and this is relative to industry. So in terms of realized pay, which is what we care about, it's what the CEOs walk home with, there is a great deal of pay for performance, uh, Barney Frank notwithstanding. Uh, are boards doing anything? A uh, paper I wrote with uh, Bernadette Minton looks at turnover in the Fortune 500 uh, over uh, the last 14 years. And uh, what do we find? Uh, CEO turnover is probably higher today than it's been at any time in the last uh, 35 years. and maybe higher than any time uh, on record because it's probably higher today than it's been. A uh, CEO can expect to be in his or her job six years today versus 30 years, uh, sorry, versus 10 years uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, CEOs are penalized for poor performance. Uh, turnover goes up if you perform poorly relative to the industry, if your industry performs badly, and a little bit uh, if the stock market goes down. And uh, that is arguably consistent, there are some caveats, with uh, boards having performed better in their monitoring, monitoring roles in the last uh, eight or ten years. So in conclusion, while CEO pay practices are not perfect in the U.S., there is a lot of evidence that much, if not all, of the rise in CEO pay is market driven. In fact, it's gone down since 2000 or 2001, which means maybe they are underpaid today. Uh, they occupy roughly the same place in the income distribution as in 94. The pay of other talented individuals uh, has gone up at least as much since 94. Realized pay is strongly related to performance. Turnover is up and CEOs face more performance pressure from boards. Not to mention Sarbanes-Oxley and bureauc the bureaucratization of public companies, uh, which uh, arguably imposes some psychic costs on the CEOs and the emergence of activist hedge funds to provide more pressure. So the bottom line criticism of CEOs uh, has almost certainly gone too far uh, and I think good public company CEOs are likely underpaid in the current environment and uh, I think I will now have taken my little bit more than my 10 minutes and will now 
sit down and let Rob take over. Thank you. I think I'll be less controversial. Uh, when I was in graduate school at MIT in the 1980s, there was lots of research going on in contract theory, and I was interested in that research, and also interested in law and economics, so decided it would be good to learn a little bit of contract law. So another student and I went over to Harvard Law School and sat in on a contract law case. And at the time, what would happen whenever the professor or anyone in the class used the word incentives, people would hiss and sometimes even bang their feet. There was sort of this, it seemed bizarre to an economist, but it seemed to be that there was this, this sense at, and it wasn't just at Harvard, that kind of bringing incentives into the discussion of law was inappropriate and therefore something where the right response was, was to hiss. Now, my guess is the world has changed a fair amount. Fortunately, I've been lucky enough not to be back in the classroom at, at Harvard Law School since then, but I'd be very surprised if, in fact, people um, hiss at the use of the word incentives. My guess is that almost everyone in the first year class at Harvard Law School, in fact, has read Freakonomics. And, you know, this morning you heard the word Beccarian being used. I was trying to think about what the word is for people who are followers of Steve Levitt. Are they levitators or something? I don't know. There's not a, there's not a good word for that. But my guess is that, um, that Harvard Law School students are bought into the notion that seemed a long time, you know, for a long time to be obvious to economists that incentives matter. And what's happened, I think, in the world is that there's been growing realization of the importance of incentives and a growing realization in economics and in the models and in the analysis we do that incentives and preferences have to be a little broader as, um, as we saw a fair amount of discussion uh, this morning. Now much of the early focus in the academic literature on incentives was thinking about kind of both the top and the bottom of, of economic hier hierarchy. So, so thinking about CEO pay and performance or thinking about production workers and, um, or even farmers. So, you know, stock options, golden parachutes at the top, issues of sharecropping, wages, peace rates at, at the bottom. Um, and there continues to be important, insightful work in both of those areas. But what I'm going to try to focus my comments on today are, is about some recent research that is really about the middle, in particular about incentives among managers within, but not at the top of organizations. So if we start thinking about organizations, a defining feature of organizations, the reason why we have organizations is because of some notion of division of labor. Um, and with it come, as soon as organizations get to any size, some, some degree of operating divisions, functional areas, um, business units, some kind of aggregation of workers and assets beyond the individual and um, smaller than the entire organization. Okay. These units and organizations are rarely completely autonomous. If they were, there would be no point in being part of the same organization. Right? Um, but, and of course, there are real differences among organizations in the degree of autonomy of these units. But the key thing I want to start my discussion for today is really that the units somehow, uh, that a function of any modern organization is the notion of units that have to coordinate some of their activities with other units within the organization. Um, that coordination takes place both hierarchical, hierarchically and horizontally. Um, so sometimes the way coordination works is it goes up to somebody who oversees both units and tells the units what to do, and sometimes it works more horizontally with some degree of cooperation, discussion, and communication without kind of the command from, from senior management. So if you think about sort of examples that are, that are the types of things I'm going to be talking about, uh, sharing inputs across different, uh, different product divisions, developing company-wide marketing campaigns, cross-selling products among divisions. Okay? If you think about why this coordination problem is difficult, it's that managers of units tend to have incentives that are weighted very heavily towards the unit's performance relative to the performance of the entire organization. Now, the early literature on coordination problems in organizations really ignored incentive problems, focusing almost exclusively on ideas of costly information sharing and all the work on incentives were, again, thinking about the top of the organization or the bottom, but not thinking about coordination within the organization. But coordination becomes, one, much more difficult and also more interesting and richer for thinking about it when we layer what has to be the case, which are these incentive problems on top of some notion of, 
uh, costly communication. And so incentives interact with coordination because units have these, what I'll call them parochial incentives, these narrowly based incentives. So even if there is uh, some component of pay sensitivity to company performance, individual managers of units care more about their own unit than the company as a whole. And you can think about, you know, what's the reason for that? I think there are three real reasons why we see that. First is some notion of risk aversion. You, wanna, you want managers to bear risk related to the things that they can control, not things that are outside of their control. And to the extent that they don't have a big impact on the performance of the whole firm, you want to give them narrowly based incentives. And um, second is just some notion of sharing financially in the things you do control. And third, and I think in some ways maybe most interesting and most important, even if you wanted to give division manager in incentives that were company-wide and that weren't based mainly on the performance of their own division, it would be really hard to commit to do that. If you think about, you know, the pressures from, for promotion, right? How are you going to decide who to promote, which is something managers will care a great deal about. It's the ones who do well. How do you figure out whether a manager is doing well? How well does that individual's uh, division perform? And even if you try to avoid that, the outside market pressures on for the, for the talent of that individual would also force you to, to, in fact, do that. So I think we're stuck, even if we didn't want to, with these sort of narrow, somewhat narrow incentives within, within firms. Uh, so the problem then becomes is that coordination becomes difficult. And this becomes sort of, you know, let me, let me talk about an example maybe. I think this is best in the context of an example. Um, it's, a case, it's a case that actually, it's about Jake, uh, Joseph Sukar Company, which is, um, which, um, is the motivation for a paper that I've uh, recently written with Luis Garacano and Wouter Desain, two of my two of my colleagues, and we actually use this case study, it's a Harvard case study, as the final exam, take home final exam in a PhD organizational economics class that Luis and I taught, I think it's five years ago. And we asked the students, as the entire take home final was develop a model to demonstrate what's going on in this, um, in this case study, the organizational issues, and it's taken us five years and had to add a, a a third co-author to actually write the answer key to, uh, to this exam. Uh, I think maybe we graded it a little harshly given what we now know. Um, but anyway, this company, Joseph Sukart, Swiss coffee and confectionery company, leading market share in, in confectionery products in, in Europe. This took place in the late 80s, so they were planning for European integration that was going to occur in 1992. Very decentralized firm, focused um, with general managers who had their own the divisions had their own manufacturing, marketing, everything, just a very small centralized organization. They realized that the in European integration would give them an opportunity to save costs by merging manufacturing divisions. So they're going to go from 19 plants to, um, to, to six primary plants that are going to serve all of Europe. The problem was, right, that the general managers were going to lose responsibility for manufacturing. They were going to centralize manufacturing but the individual general managers of the business would maintain controls of sales and marketing. So now profit measures, which before were a very good measure of performance of everything the division did, now incorporate transfer pricing for manufacturing and standardization of manufacturing uh, within the company. So now all of a sudden the general managers lost control of some of the things that, that mattered. And now they had to discuss and coordinate product design with the manufacturers. And the manufacturing division manager basically had some control and the problem was that each of the individual general managers didn't have a big incentive to make concessions that were interested that were in the interest of the company as a whole. So all of a sudden what happened was as, as the company tried to take advantage of the cost savings associated with European integration, it cost them on the incentive side. These managers were very high priority incentives to maximize the profits of their company, there's a downside to that, which is that they had reduced incentives to share information, communicate, and coordinate activities within, within the firm as a whole. And I think that, that trade-off is kind of a fundamental trade-off within organizations. And I think when you start thinking about this trade-off, the trade-off, you know, the term economists, the term we use is multitasking. There are two things that matter that you want to give incentives for. One is the things, you know, the performance of your division. The second thing is coordination and cooperation and communication within the organization. 
those two things can be in conflict and there are trade-offs in creating incentives for those things. And we argue in this paper, we develop a model, we argue in this paper that this provides insights into thinking about a lots of, many of the problems associated with some of the big mergers or failed mergers that we see. So for example, Time Warner AOL, which failed for a number of reasons, mainly because they overpaid, but one of the things that, one of the benefits from that merger, supposedly was going to be they were going to cross-sell and jointly sell advertising across both online, internet-based ads and traditional media ads. But the problem is, unlike, unlike Joseph Sukart, they didn't create a new manager who had control, who could set prices, who could, who could actually determine this, but they said everyone get together and cooperate, all the different business units. And surprise, surprise, everyone had narrow incentives, they had no reason to cooperate, and they didn't, and this initiative basically uh, basically failed. And the notion, right, I think organizations sometimes miss the notion that in fact in order to get these, um, these cost savings or synergies to occur, you have to, there's a cost, the cost comes in either they're not going to do it or and if you give them incentives to do that, it's going to lessen the strength of, of, the, um, of the, in, the narrow incentives to maximize the value of the things that you do directly control. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of details about some of the subtle things when you, when you do theory. The hope is to come out with some, some empirical implications. Can we say things about what, when it's easier or when it's harder to, um, to, get the, um, to actually achieve these kinds of cost savings and synergies? But I think what's important as we start thinking more carefully about incentives within the firm is to think, uh, think about these kinds of trade-offs. Let me give um, one other um, quick example um, where I think the literature has advanced significantly also over the past, uh, past 20 years, let's say. Um, that's in thinking about vertical integration questions. There's an old literature, the way people used to think about vertical integration, old models and old theories of vertical integration basically assumed that incentive problems were solved and that the benefit from integrating a firm for a buyer to, to purchase, uh, purchase a supplier was that now all of a sudden incentives were aligned. And in fact, the realization due to Sandy Grossman and Oliver Hart, Sandy Grossman used to be on the faculty, but I think he predicted Steve's study and decided to go into um, managing money instead of being an academic, seeing the, seeing the financial returns. Their insight, part of one of their insights was that there's no reason, just because you say these two units are now part of the same firm and they have common ownership, doesn't mean that their incentives are aligned. So if we start thinking about what determines whether or not buyers and sellers should integrate or not, can't be driven by magically solving incentive problems. So we have to dig deep and think carefully about how incentive problems are solved within the organization as, be as between organizations. And I did a study once uh, which related to this um, to look at kind of to see one of the big differences is that the kind of the way incentives can adapt inside organizations is much greater because senior management has control rights over the assets and they can basically, there tends to be greater flexibility than with the hard written contracts between organizations. And you can see this, the study of internet retailing. And if you think about, think about khakis, think about buying a pair of khakis. Uh, go back to the early days of the internet, mid-90s, and you decide, you know, you're like me, you don't want to shop in stores, you want to shop online. All right, if you wanted to buy, think about, and think about two brands, think about Eddie Bauer and Nautica. From my perspective, I think from most people's perspective, there isn't a lot of difference in the product. It was really easy to buy a pair of Eddie Bauer khakis online. It was impossible to buy a pair of Nautica khakis online. Why? Well, Eddie Bauer is vertically integrated. They, uh, they own their retail stores. And the big problem associated with, with bringing products online was the notion of channel conflict. That, you're gonna, that if you're Nautica and you start selling Nautica khakis online, your retailers who are con with whom you have contractual arrangements are going to be upset. Same thing internally. The store managers at Eddie Bauer are going to be upset as well. You can say as senior manager into Eddie Bauer, We'll take care of you. We'll figure out something that will work. We're doing it. We control the brand. It's good. Um, and maybe some will quit. Maybe some won't. While the department stores, if you had Nautica, you say, don't worry about it. The department stores might say, sorry, we're going to buy our, our khakis from Polo or somebody else. So the risk to your business, the ability 
to flexibly change contracts and the way to control the incentive problems within the organization can vary dramatically as well. And I think what's happening in more, this is just an example of the type of, type of thing economists are starting to study where in fact we're getting to richer and richer understanding of the way incentives vary within organizations, the impact they have and the impact that they have on um, organizational structure and, and the like. And um, let me end there. I think my time is up and turn it over to Marian. talk about something something different. Uh, there's, there's a component of managerial incentive in it. So I guess what, what I want to talk about is uh, kind of a topic that's been uh, of interest to me over the last, uh, I guess, five years or four or five years. Um, kind of issues of like, you know, family farms and, you know, think about, you know, why family farms exist and, you know, how, you know, what, what, what's the relevance of having family members be involved, especially in management of, uh, of farms. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of want to touch on some of the work I've done, also some of the work that um, kind of a current co-author of mine uh, has been doing in the U.S. His name is Francisco Perez Gonzalez. Um, and I think that the main motivation, just put everything down there, I think for kind of starting this topic has been the realization, and I think that realization, I think, came, you know, maybe like, you know, I don't know, 50, that 10, 15 years ago that, you know, family farms are really pervasive if you look, you know, if you look around the world and it's not the, you know, it's not the case that, you know, family farms is just a phenomenon that's reduced to like your small kind of, kind of mom and pop operations, which I think was, you know, for a long time my prior, but, you know, family business are really prevalent even in large publicly traded corporations. And, you know, that's true outside of the U.S. and I think that's very much kind of where, you know, kind of where people, people started. So, I think 10, 15 years ago, you know, there was a lot of work trying to document, look, we know what firms are, how firms are organized like in the U.S., what is it like outside the U.S., and so let's go and look. And I think people realize that, you know, firms outside of the U.S. are organized very differently than they are in the U.S., so your kind of traditional kind of, you know, kind of separation between, you know, kind of between ownership and control doesn't seem to be, you know, as, as salient outside of, outside of the U.S., and outside of the U.S., you've got a lot of, uh, of these organizations which, which are more complex, and let's describe them as, you know, let's call them business groups, but you have basically a set of firms that kind of, kind of linked to one another through kind of somewhat very complex chain of ownership. But the thing that's salient about these organizations is that ultimately there's a large shareholder that tends to be a family. You know, so for people who have been you know, putting a lot of these data together, uh, and you know, I think the bottom line is that about half of like publicly traded, traded farms around the world have a family as one of the largest shareholders. Um, it's harder to put a kind of, kind of an actual number as to like how important families are in management. I don't think it's 10%, but they are also very, very prevalent in management. And trying to kind of get at that number is one of the things that people are very excited about uh, right now. But again, this is not just a phenomenon, I think, you know, outside of the U.S., in the U.S. as well. So, uh, you know, founding family members are either officers or directors in about a third of the firm that are on the S&P 500. So there you've got kind of an issue because, you know, you said that Bill Gates, you know, you could qualify kind of Microsoft as being a family firm. But if, even if you ignore the first generation and you know, ignore the founder and just look at second generation family members, in about a fifth of the firm that are, that are on the S&P 500, you've got some second generation family members that's either an officer or a director. So again, family firms are out there, they're outside of the US, but they're also very, very prevalent, you know, even in your, um, kind of your large public utility firms in the US. So, you know, the kind of question that I think people have been, you know, interested in so far, and again, I, I think there are, you know, kind of partial answers, um, you know, so far to, to a lot of those, but one is just, you know, what, what is the impact of this inherited control? What is the impact of having family members? And again, I'm, I'm mainly interested in, like, the presence of family members in management and in what I'm doing here. Uh, what is the impact of, like, having basically, you know, the son kind of replacing his dad at the head of the company for the company's performance? That's one of the questions that people have been working on. I think the other one is, um, and it, that one has been especially relevant, and that's kind of work I've been kind of, kind of more directly involved in uh, outside of the U.S., which is like, if you think about family, you know, kind of these family farms, especially in the context of like these business groups, is there a sense that the family per se, you know, start with the founder, you kind of go down generation by generation, that the family per se, because of the way it's evolving, you know, is affecting the way the business look? Is there a sense that when I look at the family tree and, you know, kind of, family of, of, of a founder of, a, of, of one of those business groups, is there a sense that the way the, the group looks reflects, you know, some of the structure of the family? And I'll be, I'll be more specific about that, but, I, you know, especially kind of having in mind issues about the size and number of companies in the business. 
And then finally, the, the, the last bullet point, but I think that one is just, you know, I really don't think we have good answers. I'm just going to show you some kind of, you know, correlation that I found interesting. You know, why really are family firms so prevalent, you know, in, in, in many parts of the world, especially in light of like, you know, what I think are, you know, at least in my mind, kind of the current answers we have to the first bullet point, which is that, you know, it looks like family management has a negative impact on performance. So despite that, why do we see so many, uh, so many family firms? Uh, but again, let me try to kind of, kind of give, give you a little bit of insight as to what people have, have done so far on that first bullet point. So, you know, what is the impact of like inherited control on, uh, on firm performance? So I just put in two columns, a few quotes, kind of trying to talk about, you know, um, set of arguments that have been, you know, that have been kind of uh, expressed as to why, you know, having, you know, your son kind of taking over the business could enhance the business performance, and on the other side, a set of arguments that would go in the opposite direction. So I think that the, 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 the arguments for like, you know, kind of family control, inherited control, kind of weakening performance, you know, I think the first one got this Warren Buffett quote, I think is just, you know, very much summarizing it. Um, you know, I think a lot of these arguments have got to do with like nepotism, right? So you basically, you know, as the founder of a business, you kind of derive some kind of value from having, you know, um, kind of, you know, your son or uh, someone that's related to actually taking over um, at the helm of the business. So these are the sort of arguments where basically kind of some money is left on the table because, you know, the founder derives some kind of benefit from, you know, from having his son, uh, his son taking over. But, but they are arguments that go in the other direction. So they are sort of arguments, so I'll, you know, kind of th that first one where, you know, in some cases, the, the, the reputation of the company, the brand of the company is very much escaped with like, you know, the name of the family. And so, you know, keeping the family there, you know, in kind of very central kind of management role uh, would make sense. They also a set of arguments that I think, you know, are about, you know, if you think about, you know, firms, um, maybe sometimes the market puts too much pressure on firms, firms tend to be too myopic. They take decisions that really about satisfying the market in the short run. And there are some view that like family members in a sense may be more patient and they really care about kind of a long-term perspective for the firms. Outside of the states, I think there's been kind of arguments talking more about, you know, the fact that there's a lack of like good managerial talent out there. And that may be one reason you may need to actually keep the business, you know, uh, in the hands of the family. Um, and also arguments about, you know, kind of, for example, the, the, the lack of like very good kind of, um, kind of legal institutions that make it such that, you know, you wouldn't want to bring an outside manager. You only want to bring kind of someone that you know, you know, most likely, you know, so say your son, um, because you can trust, you know, you can trust that person. And, you know, because you can't really, you know, go to court if the CEO kind of runs away with the money, you know, you, you need to rely on something like trust to try to kind of uh, keep, uh, keep the business going. All right, so let me just go quickly through just a few, uh, a few of the facts. So, what does the data say in the US? You know, there's one, I think, really, really nice study, which, you know, definitely is not mine. I wish it was mine. Uh, it's Francisco Perez Gonzalez study. Uh, and, and what he basically did was, you know, starting with a sample of, of uh, publicly traded firms that have some concerned ownership or uh, kind, of, kind, of, uh, kind of funding family um, involvement in the business. And what he did, so it's kind of, he looked at non-financial, non traded non firms, doesn't really matter that much for us, but basically studied CEO transition in those firms between 1980 and, and, and 2000. And he basically kind of, you know, basically found about 300, you know, 330 different CEO transitions. Of those, about 200 were unrelated. I.e., there were transitions where the person that was taking over the CEO was not related to, uh, to, to, um, to you know, to, to, to the, the, the family. And another 122 were what he would, you know, classify as like, you know, family successions, where you know, the new CEO was related by blood of marriage to the departing CEO, the founder, or a very large shareholder of the company. Typically, if you look at the kind of companies where you find these family succession versus not, I mean, the, the, the companies don't look very different. The only fact that seems you know, very certain when you look at these data is that the family CEOs are much, much younger than non-family CEOs. So you've got about a, a 10 year gap. So the family CEOs are you know, about, you know, about 40 years old. All right, so what does he find? So I just got a kind of complicated table and I'm just gonna read a few of those numbers. Uh, just look at the first row of this data. It's actually not so bad. Uh, so basically, you know, ignore the rest of the table, just focus on the first row. This is basically showing, you know, what happened to ROA um, as, you know, uh, before and after the succession. So the first row, first column, you know, is basically the mean across all these 330 transitions. And it's basically a zero. There's basically no change in ROA, you know, in the three year window after the transition across these different kinds of successions. Now, what's interesting is the comparison between the column two and column three. So column two and column three basically contrast the successions that are called family successions, and column three are the unrelated successions. And there you can see that basically, 
you know, family succession is led to like a 2% lower, uh, lower ROA, and you got pretty much again to zero on the unrelated cases. And these differences, you know, mean something. It's kind of statistically uh, significant. Very interesting as well, I think, are, you know, the columns that are under family um, kind of by college type. So, so what Francisco did was actually to kind of go back and look at, you know, those sons that take over the business, what kind of college did they go to? And he basically identified about 200 colleges that, you know, you would call as like kind of selected colleges, quite selective colleges. And then among these kind of, you know, kind of sons that become CEOs, there's also a bunch of guys that don't go to any of these selected schools. So LSC are basically the least selective college. So they are the kind of guys that certainly didn't go to Harvard, but again, didn't go to any of the 200 schools in the US. And there, I mean, I think the contrast is really salient. So you can see that, you know, appointing your son as, like, as an ex-CEO really does nothing back to the business, you know, as, as long as your son was smart enough to make it to one of those 200 uh, top college. Uh, in contrast, if you appoint your son as CEO and, you know, he couldn't make it to one of those 200 colleges, that basically lowers our way by 4%. And again, this difference is very, very significant. The rest of the table basically says you got pretty much the same message whichever way you want to cut this data. Again, I think the bottom line here is that that paper, I think, kind of really showed us, and the issues with this paper, but that, you know, if you look at these successions overall, especially when, you know, kind of the old, you know, the old guy kind of brings in a song that, you know, doesn't look like he's very, very smart, you know, there's kind of value being destroyed here. Um, so I know I'm pretty much out of time. What I'm going to do is um, kind of I forget about the tables, I always put tables and it doesn't work. I've done some work in Thailand that kind of gives the same, you know, kind of the same spirit. So in Thailand, again, you are in, you know, very different environment, obviously, than, you know, uh, kind, of, kind of large public trade firm in the U.S. But we looked at the largest uh, business groups in Thailand. So, you know, the, the, the ex-prime minister of Thailand, I guess, was like the owner of one of these groups. Uh, and what we basically did is that we, be, we went back and constructed family trees for all these families. So think about trying to find the People magazine of Thailand and because uh, most of these people are in the news all the time and try to figure out, well, there was the founder and then the family tree goes like this. There was like three sons, two daughters, and then the next generation and so on and so on. And what we basically did is try to basically say, you know, get a sense as to, you know, how is this kind of, you know, business group structured? How is it performing? And how does that relate to like what the family looks like? Um, this was just cross-sectional data, which is kind of one major issue with this paper. But the bottom line of what we found, and again, I'll, I'll put the table, we don't really have to read it because it's, uh, it's messy, but the bottom line is that what you find is that the more son, you know, the family, the more son the founder has, the lower the performance of the business. So here, it's not just about kind of looking at the succession, it's basically saying, I got this family tree, I got a guy that ended up having lots of sons, you know, that is enough to basically lower the performance of the business. What I think, you know, even more interesting is that, you know, you find this clear contrast that when the founder is still alive, it doesn't matter whether he has like one son, two sons, three sons, you know, there's a sense the founder keeps control of things. Things get going really bad when the founder basically dies. Um, the other message that we got was to look at, you know, the structure of these businesses. So what we did, remember, you, you have business groups, so you have many different companies. And we basically counted the companies in each of these business and we look at the size of the business. And what you find is that, again, there's a relationship between what this business looks like and what the family tree looks like. Specifically, the more sons the founder has, the more companies there are in this business group. It's not that the group are bigger in terms of total assets. They're basically broken down into more units. As if, and again, it's not like I've got a good proof of that, but at least it's kind of suggestive of, well, I've got this son here, and I want to give him you know, a good position. So I'm basically going to just take one company, split it into two, and you know, each of them will basically get one of the top jobs in the business. So I think that's kind of really interesting because again, you see that happening in those cases where the founder is no longer there, not if the founder is alive. But this goes beyond just saying there's an impact on performance, there's really also an impact, you know, potentially on how these groups are structured, and I'll spare you on, on the details. And the very fi final thing I'll say and, uh, is that this question is, okay, so if these families look like they are destroying value, seems to be true in the States, seems to be true in like kind of, kind of the Thai kind of uh, kind of the Thai study that we did, which again is just purely cross-sectional, why are they so prevalent in, in many countries? And there, again, I, I really don't think we've got a good answer, but what, what I try to do is, is something very descriptive where you put together kind of a cross-country data set and you try to kind of get a sense across these countries, you know, what's the average size of firms, how prevalent are families in business? And we basically kind of link that to some um, measures of the importance of families in countries. So, you know, we have data set where they ask subjective questions about, you know, how much do you love your mom and how much do you love your dad? 
uh, well, not exactly that, but like, you know, should kid, you know, be obedient and, you know, should kid help their parents? So you can basically, across countries, I think we were able to do that in 50 countries, get an index of like, you know, how important are families? And what you find is that there's a pretty good correlation, but again, it's just really just a correlation, between the strengths of families in countries and the importance of life family firms in those countries. And this correlation is still there, even if you account for you know, things like education and human capital. So it says there might be really something there where this idea of like, you know, nepotism, or at least families that put some weight on you know, protecting the kids and keeping things internally, you know, might be a driver of like, um, the structural funds. So I'll stop there because I'm out of time. Okay, in our remaining few minutes, Jesse, would you like to? Okay. We can answer questions. If you're offended, you're appalled, you agree, uh, you want to make a statement, that's fine. Just uh, raise your hand. Okay, we got some questions right here. Austin, that's for you. For <laughs> <laughs> I'm passing it to assign it to each of you. Okay, Steve, you want to start? Please what? don't say whatever the question you just answered in your last paper. <laughs> well, it's, uh, what have we what have we learned, and what uh, I, I think it's still a big question going forward um, as to what the the right way is to compensate people and, and what the the most appropriate form of incentives are. I think people would say we've learned a lot in the last 10 or 20 years about what works and what doesn't, but I would also guess people would say we probably haven't nailed it either, you know, certainly not academically and maybe not practically, and I think that's something that's still worth studying, and it's, you know, it's good because that's what I do, and so I'll have things to do for the next, uh, uh, you know, five or ten years. When Steve Levin and I were in graduate school, Steve, you may not know, but he started his career as in, like, political economy. And Steve, Steve Kaplan. Steve Levin, Steve I'm talking Levin. About. Right, and that's what I meant. You're trying to take credit for <laughs> So at that time, it was like first year or second year of graduate school, and I asked Steve, I was like, what are the outstanding questions of political economy that still, you know, what do people work on? What are the big, and he, and he we were talking on the phone, and he named like four things, and I wrote them down, like this. and then about an hour later, he called back, and he said, you know, I'm thinking about it. All I did is tell you all the things I'm working on. You know, I, that wasn't necessarily the biggest thing. Just throw away what I told you. Um, I appreciate that Steve, Steve Kaplan's was of a broader vision. Marianne, do you have anything you want to add or Rob? Uh, yeah, I actually agree. Basically, agree with Steve. I think that um, we don't. You know, this his answer to this question, not his whole presentation. Uh, <laughs> I think that it's. Um, you know, one of the interesting things is I think that uh, economists have had a very big impact on the way on the way folks are paid, and I think you know, I think what we've learned is that it's more subtle than we originally thought, and that um, you know there are lots of things going on. I think there's a lot to learn. I think it's very hard to pin down what the biggest achievement, either what the biggest achievement's been or what the the biggest outstanding questions are. But I think it's certainly going to be a rich area going forward. Okay, another question. So, so the exit, the exit. So package, rationalize that, Steve. No, it's very easy. Uh, David Yermak. Um, I mean, there, there, there are two answers to that. And the first is David Yermak um, wrote a paper about exactly these exit packages and employment contracts. And uh, as opposed to me, who I'm kind of a, a market-oriented person, or I, or I think that's what the data show. He's very skeptical of CEOs. He's sort of antagonistic toward them. And uh, he wrote this paper on exit packages. He basically found the median exit package in these deals like a million bucks. 
and the average the average was higher is about five million, but it was basically uh, on the order of a year's pay. And you have to be careful with these exit packages. So, for example, Nardelli, Nardelli, you know, is reported as two hundred million dollar package. He wasn't paid for performance. Yeah, two two responses, three responses to that. Response number one, uh, a lot of that was contracted for up front, was basically a payment for what he had at GE when he came over to Home Depot. So it's unfair to call that an exit package. A lot of it was an entrance package. Number two, a ton of it was restricted stock, which means he was paid for performance. If that stock had gone up, he would have made more. That stock didn't go up as much, he got less than, you know, based on the entrance package. And then the third point about Nardelli, which was never reported, um, you know, everybody said, oh, shareholders should be involved in decisions. You know, this was the board not acting uh, vis-a-vis shareholders. Um, Nardelli's board at Home Depot that hired him consisted of Bernie Marcus, founder, owned two and a half billion dollars of stock. Arthur Blank, founder, owned a billion dollars of stock. Ken Langone, uh, early investor on the board, owned three quarters of a billion dollars of stock. So the people making the decision to hire Nardelli owned over five billion dollars of stock. Was that before or after Nardelli got through with it? After, <laughs> after, at, on his announcement of his being hired, stock went up ten percent. So the market thought it was a good idea. The largest shareholders thought it was a good idea. Did the guy deliver? I guess not. Although, you know, he did a good enough job that Chrysler hired him subsequently. So um, that's a long answer to your question, but basically people have studied it. I don't think it would change the results. Okay, we got time for, for one or two more. In the back. Hedge so, fund managers. Okay, yeah. if you couldn't hear it. What do you think of the pay package of hedge fund managers? <laughs> this is next you know, it's, it's very, very nice. Um, <laughs> no, I, you know, that's something where I, I think on, you know, on the one hand, uh, these are, you know, arm's length transactions. They're market oriented. And so one, uh, you know, the first reaction is, you know, if that's what the market bears, that's what the market bears. Uh, I think as a limited partner, uh, the hedge fund, the contracts with hedge fund uh, investors with hedge funds is a bit, you know, you know, puzzling because uh, you can have great performance in one year, take money off the table, and then, you know, have lousy performance the next year, and there's no clawback, but, you know, that's what the market bears, and so, uh, you know, as long as that's uh, uh, what people are willing to pay, I think that's that's fine. Do you guys have any opinion on that? They're just appalled at each thing you say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, <laughs> <laughs> No, they do get whacked. I mean, they get whacked in the sense that, you know, if I'm Nardelli and I hold $100 million of stock, when the stock goes down 50%, I've lost $50 million of value. And that, in fact, happens. That was the pay for performance uh, data that Josh and I looked at. And the hedge fund, you know, the hedge fund managers make a lot on average, but their performance is bad. They make less. Their performance is good. Uh, they make more. Now, there's another point there that people take too much risk, and that's bad. For the economy, and this is this is a general point that um, is also you know sort of missed in all the reporting is that you know when a, when you pick your head up and look at corporate America, if not you know world corporations uh, and, and but particularly U.S. corporations and how they've performed uh, over the last 20 or 30 years in terms of productivity growth, it is unbelievable. 
the productivity growth in the United States over the last 10 or 15 years, 20 years, is terrific. Now, not all of it can be ascribed to incentives and managers, but it's certainly not consistent with excessive risk. It's consistent with wonderful performance, and that's true around the world. But it's not just but high, I mean, high risk uh, implies that, yeah, there is high return, but it implies that there's systemically too much risk, and you would expect there to be um, over, over a 15-year period, um, maybe not so good performance, but productivity growth has been spectacular. Okay, it's one last question. Yes. So I didn't understand where you started. The incentive for families that you suggested is that uh, families feel that they can align the incentives of both the management, management and the business with the male notion or with the female advantage. No, okay, I mean, so the question was the main reason mm -hmm. that people say in family firms that they put the family in there is to align the incentives uh, of the management yeah, and, the and I think that's definitely one of the that I mean, naive or true? Uh, I think that's definitely one of the argument that's being made and you know especially an argument that's being made if you move to like you know kind of more emerging markets where you know it's harder to use you know kind of the kind of contracts that you know say you know I use in the US to incentivize managers maybe because these contracts can't be enforced in courts as easily so again this link between you know kind of the, the weakness of like say uh, kind of the, the, the legal institutions and the importance of family firms so that would be definitely one argument as to whether this has been proven that you know that's the reason why you know you bring the family I don't think I don't think that you know I don't think it has been proven at all um. okay well thanks our panel and thank you guys for coming